From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. A high profile, high stakes race in the region is getting national attention. And you've likely seen a lot of competing ads for the candidates in Washington's third congressional district. In this episode of Straight Talk, you meet the candidates, incumbent Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler and challenger Democrat Carolyn Long, a rematch from 2018. Washington's third congressional district encompasses eight counties, stretching from the Columbia River Gorge all the way to the Pacific Ocean. It's the only Republican-held district on the western seaboard, and Representative Herrera Butler has served the district since 2010. She's seeking her sixth term in Congress. Carolyn Long is a WSU Vancouver political science professor. This is a rematch. She challenged Herrera Butler two years ago. Up until that race, the Congresswoman had won elections by double digits. But in 2018, she beat Long by just over five points, the closest election of her political career. Long is hoping the second time's the charm and voters in the third district are ready to make a change. While Herrera Butler hopes the people of the district send her back to D.C. to help them through this challenging time. We gave the candidates an opportunity to debate here, but Herrera Butler said her schedule didn't allow for it, so the candidates will appear separately. We begin with Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. Carolyn Long will join us in our next segment. Welcome back to Straight Talk. We appreciate you joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's begin with the pandemic. What is the number one thing you will do in Congress if you're reelected to help the people of Washington's third district get through the pandemic and recover from the economic fallout? Well, I have worked nonstop since the beginning of this pandemic to give communities and individuals here every tool imaginable to help them survive both, uh, you know, safely and economically. I fought to bring the Paycheck Protection Program through Congress and in real dollar terms to Southwest Washington. And it's helped us save nearly 95,000 jobs here in the third congressional district. Nearly 9,500 employers have taken advantage of this forgivable loan program and it's helped them stay in business. I have I'm already started efforts to extend that program and make sure it goes uh, it, through the end of this pandemic uh, or through the end of this really uh, this disaster. Um, and secondly, I fought uh, for more and increased testing here in Southwest Washington and for PPE, for more supplies. I'm not going to let up on that front. We're still going to have challenges uh, here with the actual virus, and we need to make sure our frontline workers can protect themselves and can provide aid to us. And then finally, I'm going to continue to fight to make sure folks here get that unemployment assistance that we approved back in March. You know, Oregon and Washington have actually done an abysmal job of releasing those funds to individuals. There's about 30,000 uh, folks here in Southwest Washington who are unemployed uh, as a result, and largely as a result of the pandemic. And getting them their checks to help them keep a roof over their head, you know, uh, make, make their mortgage, make their rent payments has been a priority for me. And I've really gone almost case by case uh, to elevate those cases to the ESDs and make sure that they get that money that Congress approved back in March. I think all of those are gonna be part of the next several months, making sure we continue on those efforts in a very bipartisan manner. Well, let's talk about health care because that is a critical issue in this election and a high stakes Supreme Court case about the future of the Affordable Care Act is set for next month that could overturn the ACA. And according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 54 million non elderly adults with pre existing conditions wouldn't have coverage without the ACA. And it's possible a coronavirus infection could become a pre existing condition. You have voted to weaken the ACA a number of times, and your opponents' ads say you would cut protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Congresswoman, tell us specifically what you will do to protect people from losing their coverage. Well, I've never voted to weaken the ACA. I've, I voted to replace it. Um, I get my health insurance through the ACA, and I have a seven-year-old with a kidney transplant. So I am no stranger to pre-existing conditions or the need for quality, affordable health care. It's a passion of mine. I've actually co-sponsored legislation to make sure that those folks 
who get their care through the ACA will have, those folks with pre-existing conditions, will continue to have that coverage irrespective of what happens in the courts with the ACA. I also believe we need to slash the cost of prescription medications. I cross party lines uh, to vote for uh, reducing the cost of prescription drugs to put a cap on seniors out-of-pocket expenses, so much so that Big Pharma ran attack ads against me last year because it was one of their biggest, uh, scariest bills. But I think people here shouldn't be paying more for their, their prescription medications. You shouldn't have to choose between your heart medication or your next meal. I've also introduced legislation that would allow folks in Washington or across the country to purchase uh, in, uh, low cost prescriptions like in Canada, right? The, the same insulin medication that's regulated and safe in Canada is about two to three times the price here than it is there. And there's no reason for us to subsidize that. We need to have the same access to those market prices. I wanna jump um, in here I because, if I could jump yeah. in here, because a lot of people at home have probably seen the ads, your opponent saying that you're bought and sold by Big Pharma, that you're in the pocket of drug manufacturers and the health insurance industry. How do you respond to those ads? Well, I think it, it's her smoke screen, honestly. Big Pharma ran attack ads against me because I crossed party lines to vote against one of their, their kind of their sacred cows because it would slash drug prices. I'm not afraid to stand up to anybody. I'm certainly not in anybody's pocket. And I also think it's misleading of her. You know, her family has over $200,000 worth of personal investments in Big Pharma. On her financial disclosure, which she failed to file on time, it shows both stocks and retirement plans in some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the nation. I don't even have stocks. I have a I have an auto loan on a used minivan. Pharma doesn't own me in the, in any way. And, and so I think it's misleading of her to somehow attribute that to somehow directing me how to vote. When I've proven, the proof's in the pudding, I've proven I'm not afraid to stand up to anybody when it comes to the best interests of folks in Southwest Washington. And, and we'll let Carolyn Long respond to that in the next segment. I did want to go back to health care for a minute. Uh, you yeah. voted to repeal the ACA. What is your plan to replace ACA if it's thrown out? Well, I think there's a few different, there's not one piece, there's several pieces. First, we need to make sure that those folks who are on the safety nets, basically welfare, Medicaid, that their health care, the disabled, the elderly, the poor who are on that, that their care is protected. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why when Donald Trump and the Republicans put their replacement plan up, I actually voted against it. Because, and I, and I told my leadership this at the time, look, I, I know we have to replace this. It's not good enough. People here can't even get in to see a primary care doctor if they're on the ACA. That's how bad it's gotten. However, I am not willing to disable those safety nets that people rely on. We have to do better. And ultimately, that's why I voted against that bill. However, I'm not gonna stop. We need to make sure small businesses have access to health insurance. People can purchase health insurance across state lines. We have to protect Medicare. Um, that's one of the differences between my opponent and myself. She has supported a plan that would disable Medicare as we know it. And that's the wrong approach, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And I'll, I'll ask Carolyn Long about that as well. On the subject of the environment, you and Carolyn Long differ on your views of the Paris Climate Accord. President Trump withdrew the U.S. from that agreement, a move you have said you support. Why? Well, I think asking uh, the American endangered taxpayer to pay you know, upwards of 20 $20,000 more over that time period, seeing a, a skyrocket in their energy costs and their health costs, especially in a pandemic, is not the way to reduce our carbon footprint. In fact, China wouldn't have even, the, the rules that were gonna apply to us weren't even gonna apply to China. So here's one of the number one polluters, one of the number one um, aggressors on the environment wouldn't even play by the same rules. So I, I'm not for faulty international agreements. What I am for is reducing our carbon footprint in a smart, common sense way, using technology. It's why I've supported the BEST program and the Use It uh, Act. Both would, in, in one, one's a carbon ca capture technology so that we don't hamstring the economy as we're reducing our carbon footprint. And the other one uh, would incentivize more use of renewable storage technology. Both, I think, are a smart, common sense way to protect uh, the environment and to move us, you know, really to reduce that carbon, that carbon footprint without um, selling the taxpayers down the river. I now, wanna... This is a different thing my opponent and myself. I won't support a carbon tax on the American workers. And this is a huge point. It would raise gas tax in Washington or the tax on Washington Washingtonians by about 36 cents. And everything would go through the roof in terms of cost. She won't oppose this. And I think because she supports things like the Paris Climate Accord, it actually the reason she won't say she opposes it is because she wants to vote for it. 
And that's the wrong approach right now. And, and we'll talk about that some more. I did want to add a footnote here. The World Resources Institute, a nonpartisan think tank, has challenged that $20,000 cost estimate you mentioned, said it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, that there hasn't been enough analysis on that number that a lot of people have used from the Heritage Foundation. I, I wanted to move on to the I-5 bridge. Before the pandemic, it's estimated 70,000 Clark County residents commute to Oregon for work, and there's still a critical need for a new I-5 bridge. Your opponent has blamed you for not getting it started 10 years ago. What is your commitment to replacing the bridge and how long do you think it will be before we actually see a new one? There's a, a couple pieces on this one. This is so significant uh, for our region and for our regional economy. Um, first, we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. The last I-5 bridge literally would have been built too low. The Army Corps of Engineers was going to have problems even, even permitting it because it would have been, it would have impeded river traffic. Uh, in addition, it would have had a huge price tag and it would not have shaved a, more than a minute off of commute times for Washingtonians. That's not good enough, especially with the price tag it had. What I have committed to is helping with the federal funding. As a senior appropriator, I put in place a couple different pots of money that will help pay the lion's share uh, of this bridge once it comes to fruition. But we, again, we have to avoid those mistakes. We need a bridge that's going to solve problems not just for Portland and not just for Oregon, but for Southwest Washington commuters. After all, they're who I'm looking out for. The other piece, and I think this is critical, so why Oregon, the Oregon legislature has put into place a plan to toll at the I-5 and 205 bridges, not to replace the I-5 bridge, but to use that toll money, essentially pick the pocket of Southwest Washington commuters and use it for projects elsewhere in Oregon. That's a problem for many reasons. Uh, number one, it wouldn't be used for the benefit of those folks who are paying that tax, but number two, if you believe in replacing this I-5 bridge to make it safe and effective and efficient, which I do, um, that money being diverted elsewhere is, is going to be a major impediment to Oregon in its ability to help pay for its share of the bridge. So there's a few different pieces here um, that I've been very outspoken on, have helped lead on, whether it's helped getting money in place or standing up to Oregon's unfair tolling scheme. But that's something that folks here in Southwest Washington expect they need, $1,600 extra uh, for congestion pricing is not the answer. I, I have to jump in here because we only have enough time left for a final message and I want to give you a minute for this. What do you think is the most important reason voters should reelect you and keep a Republican representing the third district in Washington? Well, I think voters here expect a problem solver. They're not voting Republican or Democrat. They're voting for, they're voting for someone who's going to put them and their families and their businesses and their communities first. And I've been ranked as the number one most effective lawmaker uh, in Washington state out of the House and the Senate. And that's for my ability to solve problems. Even in the minority, I got that award because I've been able to pass legislation to help uh, low income moms and infants get better access to health care. I've been able to pass legislation uh, that has allowed us to protect our endangered salmon runs against lethal predation. I've been able to bring solutions to the table to help fund things like infrastructure here in Southwest Washington. So I don't approach this job with an ideological ax to grind. I approach it as how can we solve problems for the folks here, irrespective of whether we're in the majority or the minority. I've proven I can be effective. And if you're willing, uh, I'd love to go back to Washington, D.C. and continue to fight for you. I humbly ask for your vote. Congresswoman Jamie Herrera-Butler, thank you for joining us. For more on Congresswoman Herrera-Butler's positions on the issues, check out her website, votejamie.com. When we come back, we hear from challenger Democrat Carolyn Long. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking about the race in Washington's third congressional district. We heard from Congresswoman Herrera Butler in our first segment. Joining me now is her challenger, WSU Vancouver political science professor, Democrat Carolyn Long. Welcome back to Straight Talk. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you, Laurel. If you're elected to Congress, what is the number one thing you will work on to accomplish to help the people of your district through the coronavirus pandemic? You know, the one, number one thing that I would do is try to implement as much of my pandemic recovery plan as possible. Uh, there are three major parts of the plan. The first is to ensure affordable access to health care uh, through protecting the Affordable Care Act and expanding it to include a public option and lowering the cost of prescription drugs. To the second thing, which is lowering the barriers uh, for our workforce getting back to work, such as expanding access to affordable child care, federal minimum wage, uh, and paid family, uh, family sick leave, and supporting small business 
businesses um, through programs like the PPP and microloan programs. And then of course, the third part is investing in infrastructure. Uh, this creates good family wage jobs, but it also returns money to our economy. So the first thing of course would be healthcare, but I am hoping to pursue all of them at the same time because it will help get our economy back on track. You mentioned health care. You and your opponent have sparred on the issue of health care. You've cast doubt mm -hmm. on whether Herrera Butler would work to protect people with pre-existing conditions. And she has said you support a Medicare for all option, a single payer government run system, which you've denied. You said you support expanding the ACA and adding a public option. But in a report in the Daily News and Longview from 2018, you seem to indicate you might support Medicare for all. The article said Long said she would vote for a so-called Medicare for all bill if Democrats win back control of the House, but she said that the chances of such a bill passing Congress would be nil. That's from 2018. To clarify things, since you ran last time, have you changed your mind on Medicare for all? And if so, why? No, my position has been the same for three and a half years. And what we've seen my opponent do is cherry pick a few select sentences. And I would point to my over 60 town halls where I am repeatedly talking about what my position is, which is a public option. Um, and uh, you can access that via the web. And uh, it is just a way for my opponent to distract from her own failed efforts to protect health care for Americans. So I will say once again, as I always have, uh, what my position is, which is a public option, and draw attention to the fact that my opponent is trying to distract from her own very poor record, which includes getting rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a global pandemic. But let me let me ask you, that was from the Longview News uh, from 2018. Mm -hmm. Democrats do have control of the House now, could actually get control of the Senate, maybe even the White mm -hmm. House. If elected, would you ever vote for a Medicare for all plan? My plan is clear. It's in my pandemic recovery plan, and it is showing up the ACA and pursuing a public option. I've been, again, very consistent about that. I think that is the best, most pragmatic approach to health care policy, which also uh, continues what we want, which is that people have the element of choice. If they want to keep their private insurer, they can keep their private insurer. And, and frankly, my opponent knows this is my position. She's even running ads from 2018 saying that my position is different. So I just ask people to check the record, check the record check the record and not a single quote taken out of context. You and your opponent have traded jabs also over who's benefiting from big drug companies. And she talked about this in our first segment. The National Republican Congressional Committee is running TV ads saying you profited directly from drug companies and their exorbitant prices through pensions, retirement and stock. Have you? No, my my I have not. And again, this is a way to distract people from uh, my opponent's terrible record uh, on taking over two million dollars of corporate PAC money, uh, including money from the health insurance industry and big pharma. And so what my opponent's chosen to do is to try to attack me personally. Um, you know, I've had a job at WC Vancouver for years. I have my own pension. I've not profited from the industry. I would ask anybody to check the record, check the record, check the record, check the FEC reports and see where I get my campaign donations, which is from individual contributions, and where my opponent gets hers, which is from the drug industry, the banking industry, and big pharma. And the reason why that's so important, Laurel, is because if you look at how my opponent votes on issues, like a tax reform bill, like getting rid of the ACA, it's connected to our campaign contributions. You and Herrera Butler differ on your approach to protecting the environment. You've criticized her for supporting the Trump administration's rollback of environmental regulations. But there are a lot of Washingtonians who feel when it comes to the environment, they're being forced to choose between environmental regulations and their jobs. How do you respond to those concerns? Well, I think you can have the balance between environmental protections that protect our way of life here in Southwest Washington, where we hunt and fish and enjoy our hiking, and uh, economic development opportunities in the clean energy field. Um, so I think that being pitted against one another is really a false choice, uh, and that if we're able to pursue uh, clean, renewable energy projects, we can also uh, protect the environment and create jobs. And by protecting the environment in other ways, we can also spur economic development by drawing people to this most beautiful part of the of the district. So I don't think it's an either or proposition and uh, we can do both at the same time. I do want to give you the opportunity to respond to something that Herrera Butler said in our first segment. She said you support a carbon tax. Do you? No, I don't. And I said this in the debate uh, a month, uh, several weeks ago. You know, Laura, I have to tell you, this is one of the reasons why 
when I started this campaign, I asked for multiple debates with my opponent because when you see two people uh, facing off in that sort of a debate, you can fact check your opponent and you can sort of hold them to account for things that they're saying that are inaccurate. Uh, so I said in that debate uh, that I wasn't in favor of a carbon tax and I'm in favor of ways in which we can deal with our carbon um, issue by carbon sequestration, managing our forests uh, and bearing carbon. Uh, check the record and check the record and check the record. Congresswoman Herrera Butler supported the Trump administration's 2017 tax cuts. She says they were the cause of the robust economy before the pandemic. You've said they added more than a trillion dollars to the federal debt. If elected, would you vote to roll back those tax cuts? I would vote to change uh, the tax system. I would vote for tax reform. The current bill, which she says is her crowning achievement as a member of Congress, gives 83% of its benefits to major corporations and the wealthiest Americans. I have said we have to prioritize working families and small businesses. It's been my consistent message uh, from the beginning. Uh, and that means we have to have comprehensive tax reform that puts Main Street in front of Wall Street. Uh, and that is simply not what's done in 2017. And actually, it has added $2 trillion to the federal debt. And both the Congressional Budget Office and even the executive branch have released studies saying it did not actually spur economic growth. So unfortunately, yet another example of where my opponent is quite misleading in her selection of facts and is misleading the voters in this particular race. Replacing the I-5 bridge is something many people agree needs to happen. But with two states and the feds involved, how to get there is a different matter. Your opponent has run ads that say you support tolls. What is your position on tolls? Once again, I've never supported tolling on the I-5 bridge. The record's quite clear on that, and this is yet another attempt for my opponent to try to mislead people uh, from her own failed uh, work on the bridge. She's been in office for 10 years. At one point was on the infrastructure committee where she could have done something about this major infrastructure project, and she left the committee. She not only didn't step up to the plate, she left the stadium. My role as your federal representative will be to get as much federal funding as possible for that bridge, uh, to work collaboratively with the congressional delegation across the river in order to bring this project uh, to our district. And frankly, I think the more important question is uh, why hasn't this been fixed in 10 years? And to point out that the failure to do so means that replacing the bridge, which I favor, is now going to cost twice as much as it would have cost had it been tackled by the current representative. On the issue of systemic racism and social justice, the mm -hmm. opposition's running ads saying you favor defunding the police. Where do you stand on that? Once again, I've never said that I'm in favor of defunding the police. Uh, and uh, what I am in favor of is uh, supporting law enforcement. I had the pleasure of doing a ride along with an officer in Longview, and I saw firsthand how hard it is for them to be a behavioral mental health professional, a first responder, a protector of the peace, uh, and that we should do more to support them by also investing in programs uh, that address some of these things uh, so that the police don't have to handle them. But uh, not in favor of defunding the police, and never have been. In in fact, I have friends and neighbors who are in law enforcement. I am in awe of what they do, and I think it's very important that we have them protecting public safety at this time. Are you in favor of cutting funding at all to the police department? I'm not. And in fact, one of the things that we have to look at is uh, the fact that we have states and, and localities that are really struggling because they don't have adequate federal funding to support law enforcement. So one of the things that we can do to support the police is to make sure Congress does its job and passes um, a stimulus package that provides funding for law enforcement. They failed to do that for seven months now. It's, it's I'm sure, quite frustrating for those in the law enforcement community. I know it's certainly frustrating for the people I talk to uh, who are wondering whether or not they're going to get additional compensation for unemployment, what they're going to do about their small businesses. Um, and so I think the inaction of Congress in many regards has been a real failure of leadership, including with the representative. We have just under a minute left, but finally, the third congressional district in Washington is the last one held by a Republican on the Western mm -hmm. seaboard. Why should voters make a change and vote for you for Congress? Well, because I'm somebody who's present, accountable, and committed to working for the people of Southwest Washington, I saw that you were showing clips of my uh, drive-in town halls. Those are just the latest things that I've done to show how connected I am with the community. Before that, I held a dozen virtual town halls, all available on the web, where I clearly respond to questions about the issues, including the ones you've asked me today, Laurel. And what I am doing is being responsive to the needs of the people in the community. Uh, and I've shown that I'm a leader. Um, I've released a pandemic recovery plan. I think the 
first member of uh, uh, first uh, challenger in Congress and, and and the first person who's elected who's uh, released their own plan. And I think we need leadership now more than ever. Uh, and I think it's time for a change. Uh, when somebody's been in office for a decade and they failed to deliver on major policy issues like healthcare infrastructure, uh, they failed Southwest Washingtonians. I'm a clear alternative. Carolyn Long, thank you. For more information on Carolyn Long's positions, check out her website, electlong.com. And thank you for watching and listening. Remember to download our new podcast, and we'll see you next week for Straight Talk. We look at Oregon's fourth congressional district between Peter DeFazio and Alex Scarlatos.